Now, I'm not trying to judge you or insult you, but uh, in all likelihood, you have not been taught how to read a book. Uh, I, I know you've been taught how to read, sure, but there's a real big difference between reading a sentence and reading a book. So I'm going to hazard a guess here. I'm going to guess, you know, this guess probably doesn't apply to all, but I bet it applies to most, if not all. So I'm going to guess that when you read, especially class books, coursework, you get bored. You lose your place. When you finish reading a page, you don't know what you've read. You can't remember what you've read. You can't remember why you've read it. You don't know what the point is. You get frustrated, sleepy, tired when you read. If you do like to read, likely it's uh, fiction or the enter entertainment section of a newspaper, a blog, and even only if the entries are short enough, and, uh, you know, Facebook. When you uh, study, uh, you uh, likely only pay attention really to the bolded words or if it's a, 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 a box off to the side of the text with the word and a definition in there, you, uh, you write that down. You know, when you take notes, you probably do one of two things. You, uh, one, you uh, take bullet point notes. Right? So you just try to list some important sounding sentences uh, in, in your notes. But you don't know how they're related to each other and you don't know what the overall point is. And later on when you get to the test, you look at your bullet points and think, what am I supposed to do with these? If you don't do bullet points, likely you uh, do summaries. You try to summarize each paragraph for each section. But kind of the same thing happens. You know, you, you uh, go back to your summaries and you, first of all, you can't remember the details because you didn't write them down. And you don't know uh, how the summaries are supposed to be related to each other, what the overall point is. Likely, when you read and you look at your notes, you don't see how they're supposed to form a cohesive whole. You don't know how each part is related to each other. You may not even ask the question of how is this a cohesive whole. The only thing that you do know is that you try to write enough down uh, where you hope that it's going to be on the test and as soon as the test is over you forget about it and you no longer care. This is how a lot of students go about reading today. You don't believe people when they say that these things, these big heavy objects that are very intimidating when you open them up, are filled with ideas. They're filled with ideas that can free your mind, expand your consciousness, make you more aware of what we call the real world. You don't believe people when they say that these can help you become a better person. Well, I hazard these guesses because these were my own experiences for a long time. Uh, these were the experiences of some of my classmates. Certainly the experiences of a lot of my students in the past. And that can be kind of depressing. Well, I'm going to hazard another guess. I'm going to guess that you've been taught to read in kind of like the following few steps. Uh, you start the first sentence and you read to the last. At about, uh, oh, I don't know, every paragraph or so, you uh, stop to summarize that paragraph and try to write something down. If you, uh, don't, uh, if, you, if you don't do that, then maybe you try to highlight the text. And when you uh, try to study, <laughs> you do your best to memorize everything that you've written down in hopes of finding something familiar on the test. Well. I don't write my test in a way that you can rely upon familiarity, so that way it's not going to work when you study. You're going to have to comprehend. And when you've been reading this way, you get bored, you get sleepy. And worst of all, you don't comprehend. You probably also think something like this, you know, you think, well, why should I bother reading? After all, the professor is just going to lecture straight from the book anyway. Well, I don't know, this may come as good news, it may come as bad news to you, I don't know. But I don't lecture from the book. Now, I, I do things differently. I try to present the same material, but from a different approach. So, uh, when you are reading, the way you've been taught how to read 
is not going to work. Now, probably the most ineffective way to read is to start at the first sentence and read straight to the last. This is ineffective because you don't know what questions you need to ask in order to comprehend the material. Now, yeah, you do need to ask questions. If you are not asking questions, if you're just hoping the book will have an impact on you, that's what's called passive reading. Now, passive reading might work with some fiction, but it doesn't do a real good job uh, with nonfiction, hardly at all. Now, in nonfiction, like philosophy, history, math, the sciences, uh, you have to uh, ask the right questions in order to comprehend the material. You have to direct your attention to what's going on within the text. That's called active reading. And what I want to teach you is active reading. So, do you even know what the six basic questions are? You probably were taught the six basic questions in, say, something like elementary school, but I doubt you've thought much of them since then. Tell you what, I'm going to give you a chance to think about this. Go ahead and pause the video and think about what are the six basic questions and write those down. You're going to groan internally when I tell you. You're going to throw something at your computer screen. Don't do that, you rookie your computer. Uh, but you're, you're, going to, you're going to think they're so obvious that you don't need to write them down. Well, what would you think? What would you come up with? Well, the six basic questions are who, what, where, when, why, and how. That's it. Six basic questions. Now, yes, you groan internally and say, wow, Dr. Haugen, you just wasted 20 seconds of my life. Okay, do you write down those questions in your notes when you read material? Do you write down who, what, why, where, when, and how? I bet that if you start doing something like that, uh, your notes are going to improve a lot. You're going to get a lot more out of the material and probably you're going to be a lot less bored. Now, in... Um, in this course, I'm going to give you some specific questions to ask. They're applications of the six basic questions when we're dealing with philosophy. And even these applications are real applicable to all your other disciplines. So in other words, what you learn in how to read in philosophy is going to be really useful in history and math, even science, especially science. So uh, I'm going to give those questions to you through the course of these videos and uh, through the course of the semester. We're going to keep building on them as we go. Now, like I said, the absolute, probably the most ineffective and worst way to read is to start the first sentence and read till the last. Well, then you ask, well, what am I supposed to do? Well, you skim. Skimming is your friend. Skim well. Skim often. Skim repeatedly. When you skim, you are searching for the answers to the questions. Now, I want to be clear. Skimming is not reading fast. Skimming is selective reading. Right? Skimming is selective reading. And I'm going to take you through some steps uh, of where to skim first. Now, I don't want to say that you're never going to read from the first sentence to the last. No, of course you are. Right? But you skim first. And you might think to yourself, wow, that's a lot of extra work. Well, it's work, but it's less work than simply reading for the first sentence to the last. You get a lot less exasperated. You get a lot less frustrated. You get a lot less, you know, you are not filled with despair anymore when you uh, are given a huge reading assignment. No, when you, uh, you know, skimming is work and then reading for the first sentence to the last, but it's also highly effective, very effective. So let's take a look at some of the parts of the book that you're going to skim in order to find these questions. Well, you've heard it said that you can't judge a book by its cover. Well, this is true, to an extent. You can judge a book by its cover, just not only by its cover. A cover is a really great place to start judging a book. So let's think about the title. Right? The title is a fantastic way of telling you what kind of book it is. And by what kind of book, you might think of this as uh, in which class would this book be assigned. So you have books in history, math, science, philosophy, art, literature, uh, and you could even have like history in a specific topic, so the history of philosophy, the history of science. Uh, history of ideas courses are intensely interesting. You do yourself a favor by taking one. 
So the title of the book is going to, at the very least, or hopefully, is going to tell you what kind of book it is and which field does it belong. Sometimes the title of the book will even give you a hint as to the specific question that's being asked within that field. So you can have, for instance, a book that's a, a survey of the history of the Americas. Right? Uh, you could have a very specific question within that. So for instance, uh, what is the impact that the uh, uh, Spanish uh, immigrants had on, uh, the American, uh, on, uh, on American civilization today? That would be a question within history. The title is a great place to start. Another re really great place to start on the cover is the blurb, the publisher's blurb. This is uh, usually a short paragraph that's found at the back of a book if it's a hard cover, or excuse me, if it's a soft cover. And if it's a hard cover, sometimes it's on the back, sometimes it's uh, on that little flap. You open up the book and you have that little flap right there, sometimes it's right there. A publisher's blurb, what they're trying to do is, they are trying to sell you the book, right? But the way they try to sell the book to you is uh, by giving you at least a description of what this book is, what questions uh, they're trying to answer, uh, or you know, what is the purpose, for instance, what is the purpose of this book. Uh, another good place is, also sometimes the uh, publisher's blurb will give you some detailed information as to how the author's trying to do that, which is a really great clue to have before you start trying to read the book. In addition to the publisher's blurb, um, you know, we're, we're still dealing with the cover, uh, you also have reviews. Um, quite often publishers will have a review for a book um, that, uh, you know, is usually just by, you know, some kind of peer in the field and usually it's appreciative. I've yet to see a review of a book by the publisher that says this book stinks. <laughs> um, no, it, the uh, review that's on the cover of the book will usually be by a peer and uh, we'll try to you know, tell you that this book is good, trying to lend credibility to the book. Uh, sometimes you get to find customer reviews, right? Especially if you go to Amazon.com, you find customer reviews. Now, you know, with these reviews, you kind of have to take them with a grain of salt, right? Um, whether the reviewers liked the book or not is really not what I'm interested in when I'm reading the reviews. What I'm interested in with reading the reviews is I'm trying to find out more about the book. Right? You, you know, whether reviewers like it or not, if it's a good review, they're going to contain some kind of description of the book. Okay, So, um, and usually this description, again, it's going to be kind of like the publisher's blurb, but it's usually some kind of detailed description of what the book is like, what the question the author is trying to do, or what the purpose, you know, what is the purpose of the author, and how the author tries about doing it. And sometimes, if it's a good review, there's going to, going to be some kind of critique as to whether or not that attempt succeeded or failed and why. Beware in reviews that just say, this book is good or this book is bad. Those just aren't helpful at all. Uh, so, you know, this is how you judge a book by its cover. But like I said, we can't stop with just the cover. We actually have to open up the book. And we'll take a look at that in the next section. So we've opened up the book and we want to find out more about this book. At this point, we're still skimming. We're not starting from the first sentence or reading to the last. Uh, there are more than a few things you find when you first open the book, but let's turn to the table of contents. A table of contents uh, has many has lots of really good information when you're trying to understand or trying to skim a book for the first time. Most notably, uh, a table of contents will give you a better idea of what the purpose is. Right? Now, a table of contents will have a structure to it. And it will give you the plan, the, the how, uh, or at least what the author thinks the author is doing when, when they're trying to, to achieve this purpose within the book. So if they're giving some kind of argument in philosophy, for instance, um, you're going to see chapter titles which will give you clues to what terms, or, you know, what terms or, or, or concepts that they're using at that point and how this ultimately leads to the conclusion. In fact, you can sometimes read the argument of the whole book just by looking at the table of contents. So the table of contents is going to tell you how the book is organized, which will be really helpful later on when you're trying to quickly find information. The table of contents uh, will also give you important terms, which I will talk about in, in, in the next video. And the terms are the important concepts. Right? And a really great place to find those terms are in the, t uh, are in the titles for the chapters. Okay? Um, the table of contents will uh, also provide something like a map of the whole book. Remember when I, was, I had the analogy about getting lost in the forest? Well, 
The table of contents is your map. If you're reading a chapter and you don't know why, go back to the table of contents and try to figure it out. One place to look at the table of contents and try to figure it out from there. I mean, if nothing else, I'm going to tell you, you know, whether you're near the beginning or near the end or right smack in the middle of the book. So the table of contents is a really helpful source of information. Something that's it's not very popular these days to do so, but there are such things as section titles. And section titles used to be included in the table of contents. They don't do so much anymore. I think they're trying to fit the table of contents all on one page, which is, has its advantages and also has its disadvantages. The advantage of having the section titles in the table of contents is you get to see the whole thing. The disadvantage is um, it makes for a long table of contents. Well, let's think about the section headings. The section headings uh, ha have a lot of the same uh, advantages as the chapter titles. Right? The section headings will tell you what that section is about or should give me an idea what that section is about. And you'll find many good terms in the section headings. A section heading uh, is also useful uh, for not only knowing where to re read, but where not to read. So, for instance, if you want, if you're in a chapter in the ancient Greek philosophers and you want to find the section, you want to find uh, information about Heraclitus, uh, you need not look in the section titled Dailies. Um, chances are, if you're trying to find information on Heraclitus, look for the section titled Heraclitus. So that's uh, the table of contents and uh, the section titles. Um, we still haven't even gotten to the actual text of the book. Right? We went through the cover, we went through the table of contents and the section, and section headings. Now, let's take a look at what it means to actually skim the, the text of the book. So we're looking at uh, skimming chapters now. Now chapters, uh, skimming chapters is not all that different actually than what we've been doing before with skimming the uh, cover and skimming the table of contents. Um, what, what, one of the things that you do with skimming chapters, if you just look at any generic chapter, uh, a really great way to skim just a chapter is to skim, uh, is to read the introductory paragraph, and sometimes it's two or three, and the closing paragraph, and sometimes it's two or three, okay? And this will tell you um, it should be something like a summary of what that whole chapter look, it, it looks like. It should, it, you know, really good uh, uh, chapters written this way will give you kind of an outline of what this chapter is like. It's almost like a, a table of contents just for that chapter. Now, there's certain chapters uh, that uh, are, are going to be helpful. So, um, most often, I think people just ignore the preface for a book. Now, a preface is really helpful. Uh, a preface can, sometimes the preface will give you even more detailed information on the purpose and how the entire book is organized. Uh, quite often prefaces, if it's like a second or third edition, prefaces will tell you how there's supposed to be an improvement from this, from this most recent edition over the past editions and tell you where those improvements are. Um, sometimes it gives the motivations of the author, which are not always explicit in the book itself. And motivations, while not necessarily important to how the author was successful, can give you an idea of what the author's thinking while the author is writing this book. And also, a lot of times in prefaces, you're going to find a list of acknowledgments. And, you know, it might be some time before you really fully appreciate that, but, you know, with a list of acknowledgments, will give you, sometimes give you an idea of how thorough the author was. You know, for instance, if an author is arguing for a particular position, uh, say, uh, authors arguing that all numbers are universals. And you go to the preface and you find amongst, in the preface, you say helpful comments are given by such and such and such, and amongst those names you have somebody who thinks the complete opposite. Well, that's probably a good thing. That means that the author is trying to do his or her homework when arguing for the conclusion. Uh, after the preface uh, is, ho hopefully there's going to be an introductory chapter. Yeah. An introductory chapter I mean, I suggest reading the entire introductory chapter uh, as, a way to, as a way to read the whole book. So the introductory chapter quite often will uh, provide an outline of the book. Again, you should mirror the table of contents. And the, chap the introductory chapter will probably tell you what the author thinks the, uh, is the correct answer to the question that the author is dealing with. Sometimes authors are, can be a little coy about this. They don't want to reveal all their cards at the beginning of the book, and that's okay, I, I, I get it. Um, but, uh, you know, just keep in mind that the author is going to, usually an author will tell you not only what question explicitly, and maybe in like a really direct format, you can copy down directly in your notes, what the author's trying to do, 
uh, what, and if you're dealing with philosophy, what's the question the philosopher is trying to ask, and quite often will contain the answer that the philosopher thinks is the correct answer to that question. Um, you know, you might have heard it said that you shouldn't ruin a mystery novel by reading the last chapter first. Well, go ahead and do that with nonfiction. <laughs> That's completely okay. With nonfiction, go ahead and read the concluding chapter. Uh, whereas the author might be a little coy in an introductory chapter, the author is usually really explicit in the concluding chapter. Uh, the author quite often tells you exactly what the author thinks he or she is doing uh, through, the, through the course of the whole book. And again, this provides another outline. Um, so, you know, what, what I mean by coy is sometimes in the introductory chapter, the author will give kind of a teaser question and suggest a, um, how shall we say, uh, perhaps a controversial answer. In the concluding chapter, the, the uh, author is really explicit uh, and, and gives something of a short explanation as to why that answer may be controversial, but nonetheless true. So quite often you'll find that in the concluding chapter. So this has been about skimming the book, okay? Um, and sk sk skimming the contents of the book. So we talked about the preface, the introductory, the chapter. What about the other chapters? Well, go ahead and skim those too. Yeah. And, and even before you sit down to read the first sentence to the last sentence in the chapter itself, skim the chapter. And again, skimming is not fast reading, skimming is selective reading. So you skim by reading the first one or two or three paragraphs and the final one or two or three paragraphs. Quite often, that'll give you an idea of what that whole chapter is about. Um, and you know, even within, you know, even outside of those paragraphs, skim the first two sentences. Of the chap of, of a paragraph in the chapter, it'll tell you what. Hopefully, it'll tell you what that paragraph is about. And this again, this is really useful when you're trying to quickly find information. So while you skim, you should take notes, and those notes will be based upon the six questions, or you know, about the questions that I, I talked about uh, earlier. Now, when you skim and you're taking notes, this is what's called active reading. Now, active reading is when you make an effort to uh, try to learn what is uh, uh, contained in the book. And what this means exactly is something like this, you know, trying to understand the definition. And a lot of understand the definition is knowing how it's going to be applied in different circumstances. Uh, a lot of understanding a definition is knowing how that definition is different from other defininations. Uh, it, you know, difference need not mean contrary or, or, or uh, contradictory. It might might mean how one implies the other, right? How one, uh, 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 so, you know, if, for instance, if you say that uh, a rose is red, well, that follows that a rose is colored, right? So, um, you know, a large part to, uh, to reading and to comprehension is uh, for an active, is to be an active reader. You have to understand, you have to make an effort and try to use those concepts and, and judgments in different circumstances. Now, if you don't, if you're not trying to be an active reader, if you just expect the book to make an impression upon you, it's not going to happen. This is why you get bored, right? You are reading and you get lost in the words and you don't know what's going on. It's because you're not trying to keep anything in your head and see how it's all related to, uh, to everything else. If you um, just passively read, you're going to fall asleep. So while you're skimming, you should take notes. And I'm going to have several suggestions on what questions you try to answer and how to take those notes. And I'll uh, explain those questions in uh, later videos and during the course of the semester. This is going to be something that you're going to have to learn and practice the entire semester. You're not going to get it overnight. And that's okay. Right? This is, this is a process. Speaking of notes, um, did you take notes during this video? Um, do you know what the main point of this video is? I mentioned a really important skill early on. Do you know, can you remember what that skill is? Did you write it down? Um, did you, uh, uh, I, you know, I, did you write down the main points of this video? I listed several different parts of a book earlier. Do you know those parts of the book off the top of your head and why they're important? Did you write them down? Well, if you didn't do any of these things, you didn't learn. And if you didn't learn, uh, you're not going to do well in, in this course or, frankly, any course.